Once a survivor of sexual or physical abuse at residential school is awarded compensation by the federal government, there's a lot of things that can happen to that money. Here's APTN Investigates' Kathleen Martins with more. There, I, I counted, I, I never actually counted all of the signatures. I would assume hundreds. I'll, I'll show you in a second. Um, it's just, it's gross. Form filler Kelly Bush shows the paperwork involved in filing a compensation claim for serious abuse suffered at Indian Residential School. Survivors are eligible for up to half a million dollars for physical and sexual abuse. But that is the exception. The average payment is about $105,000. Kelly worked for a company in Alberta called Honor Walk. She says it paid her to find survivors in Saskatchewan and complete their compensation forms. Under the guidelines, survivors and law firms can use third parties to complete the forms, but the fee can't be taken off the compensation payment before survivors get it. Honor Walk describes itself as a for-profit company. It claims it's Canada's largest Indian residential school consulting and form-filling firm. It says it's helped 3,000 people with their compensation forms since 2006. Honor Walk also says it doesn't charge for its services and claims to be more knowledgeable in the compensation field than even the Canadian government. But Kelly has a document that says survivors' lawyers will collect $4,000 on Honor Walk's behalf. Kelly says form fillers were paid $125 per application and pushed to complete at least 40 forms per month. So you were being paid $125 for something they were getting $4,000 for? I would assume, I'm not sure because in here it says $4,000 for the document collection fee. So maybe they were receiving more. The fee is listed in a slew of documents form fillers had survivors sign. But Kelly's not sure survivors knew what they were paying for. It took me about two months to realize that maybe people's literacy skills were very they limited because of the abuses that they suffered in school. How can people learn when they're being tortured every day? Kelly became the manager of Honor Walk's Saskatoon office in 2009 after answering an ad like this one in a community newspaper. At its height, she says Honor Walk claimed to have 2,500 form fillers working in Western Canada. Kelly says form fillers were pushed to record intimate details of survivors' abuse because the bosses were very specific about how claims should be completed. We basically were pressured to try and find the highest level of abuse at all times. And what would Honor Walk do with all of those completed forms? When I asked that question, I was told to stop thinking too much. I really got told that lots. <laughs> Kelly discovered Honor Walk had a relationship with Blot and Company. Among the forms survivors signed was a contingency fee and retainer agreement for lawyer David Blot and his associates. That's Honor Walk. That's Blot and Company. Form filler Kelly Bush says she rented office space here for David Blot and Company. She says she picked it because it's right around the corner from homeless shelters where a lot of residential school survivors stay. She says the adjudicators would come here, meet the survivors, and hold the compensation hearings. Kelly says she was in constant touch with her bosses at Honor Walk head office in Bragg Creek, Alberta, and this satellite office in Cardston, Alberta, near the Blood Reserve. We wanted to speak with Honor Walk president, Tom Denom. But when we called, we were told he was out of the country. We looked for him anyway in Bragg Creek, where he lives. People there told us the business operates through a box number at the local post office. One person who did meet Tom Denom is residential school survivor Doris Bird. She says he appeared at her home on the blood reserve wanting to fill out her compensation claim. So he wrote everything down and he said, well, I'll be back, I'm going to come back. He never did come back. Doris says she told Denom about being sexually assaulted at residential school. She says he never explained who he worked for, but documents show she became a client of David Blot. I really never really did meet David Blot. Um, just, I just go to that Western Union, he'd give us directions where to pick up the money. And the money was three personal loans in advance of her compensation payment. 
Doris says they were arranged by David Blott after she called the Honor Walk office in Cardston. An invoice from Blott and Company shows Doris was charged 22% interest on the loans. It was taken off her compensation payment by the law firm, which receives the money from the government in trust for the client. Doris says she also paid for a big screen TV she was offered for her grandson, who was dying of cancer in a Calgary hospital. During that time, I went outside and I was sitting in my vehicle, and I knew that there was something wrong. I kept telling my daughter, tell that guy for some receipts, but he, he never did bring any. Doris's compensation check came to $27,000. She had been expecting more than $100,000. She says she was asked to keep the amount a secret. When I got this check that day, they told me that I can't say anything about it. I can't tell anybody that I can't ever talk about it to anybody. I had to sign that paper stating that I would never say anything about it. I was thinking to myself, you know, why would they say that? You know, there's something going on. Doris says the stress of the ordeal affected her health. I did get sick. I did. I had a mild heart attack because of that. When I lost my grandson and what happened. <laughs> Doris's chief, Charles Weaselhead, believes people were taken advantage of while waiting, sometimes two and three years, for the big payouts their lawyers promised. Advance money is being uh, given to them at a high percentage rate, you know, and stuff like that. So by the time the check arrives, you know, they've either taken uh, all of the advance uh, by this time, being charged a high interest rate, you know, whether whether uh, some loan uh, agreement has been made or not. When you heard that, what? How did you feel? That well, <laughs> definitely, I I I, I think there's just uh, another form of control, uh, mismanagement. You know, when when a firm is taken advantage of an individual that perhaps does not know his rights, that perhaps does not know. Uh, to speak up and say, you're charging me too much, you know, uh, they clam up, they don't say anything like that, and the firms are charging them uh, a price, you know, uh, way beyond w w what should happen, you know. Weaselhead would like to see compensation cases reviewed, and he questions whether everyone involved in the process is doing his or her job. We received, you said, a general response from the chief adjudicator and mm -hmm. from the national chief. Was that satisfactory to you? No, uh, at this point in time, I, I, no, nothing seems to be moving forward, you know. And I, I've raised a red flag, you know, to people responsible for that, you know. But in my view, you know, there, there are certain people responsible for ensuring, you know, that all individuals going through this process are heard, you know, in, that the hearing is, in, uh, is fair. Fair? Yeah. And how about credible? Celeste Barassa has serious concerns about the accuracy of compensation applications she collected for Honor Walk. Once we fill out our forms the way we're supposed to, the way we're told to, and we hand them off to, some, to somebody else, we don't know what happens to those forms. Barassa and her boyfriend say they worked as form fillers for Honor Walk. They say they traveled to reserves in Saskatchewan in search of survivors. Celeste says she was asked to adjust the abuse details to suit the lawyers. Generally, survivors who suffered the worst abuse are entitled to the most compensation. Adjudicators add up the amount based on a point system for levels of abuse. That was the one thing that really, really bothered me was the aggravating factors. Well, it bothered, it bothered Kelly too. When we first started, it was like, we're supposed to check off everything, all of them, whether they happened or not. Then all of a sudden we got an email from the lawyers saying, no, you're supposed to only check off these five main aggravating factors, even if the other ones were there or not. It's irrelevant. It's like Many lives have been disrupted or even destroyed by the residential school's legacy, but the apology, the compensation, and a chance to be heard are very important to the survivors as they try to heal and move on. We'll have more on that after the break. <laughs>